No. Hi, welcome to Custody Matters Live with Danica Joan and Wendy Perry. We have an amazing guest here for you today, Dr. Daniel Fox. Uh, I'm going to have Wendy talk to you a little bit about his background, but before I do, I also wanted to share with you, she has some amazing opportunities that she's presented that she uh, went on went live with, which is a members-only parental alienation support community. I'm so happy and so excited for my co-host. Uh, and of course, you can find her information on wendyjperry.com uh, and look for her members-only uh uh, alienation support community link. Uh, also, uh, just kind of giving myself a little kudos, we have, I have an online co-parenting course that I offer on uh, my website, which is kidsneedbotho.org. So uh, I just wanted you to be present to those resources that you have available. And of course, you can always private message Wendy or myself with any kind of uh, concerns and, um, and we can talk to you personally. Uh, around coaching and and so forth. So, Wendy, Wendy, tell us a little bit about Dr. Daniel Fox. Yes, uh, Dr. Daniel Fox is a licensed psychologist who specializes in the diagnosis and treatment of personality disorders. He is passionate about helping mental health professionals and clients learn more about strategies to manage personality disorder issues. And he has written some books. Uh, they are The Clinician's Guide to the Diagnosis and Treatment of Personality Disorders, Antisocial, Borderline, Narcissistic, and Histrionic Workbook. And he has also written The Narcissistic Personality Disorder Toolbox, 55 Practical Treatment Techniques for Clients, Their Parents, and Their Children. And wow, is all of that very relevant in our uh, world of parental alienation and co-parenting issues. And I also want to let our viewers know that Dr. Fox will be one of the presenters at the Revealing Unseen Child Abuse Symposium in Houston, Texas on October 18th, 2019. And that is hosted by the nonprofit organization Children for Tomorrow. So Dr. Fox, welcome to Custody Matters Live. And thank you so much for spending a little bit of time with us tonight. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Well, um, parental alienation, uh, as you know, is a huge problem, and uh, we have a lot of online groups, and personality disorders are very frequently brought up uh, in our world uh, in these discussions about parental alienation, and so I'm super excited that you're going to be a presenter at the upcoming conference, because it's something that a lot of the alienated parents and the advocates talk about, but I am i don't believe that we've really had a, uh, a someone who specializes in personality disorders speaking at one of our conferences. So um, if you would, tell us a little bit about your your background and, and how you came to specialize in that field. So um, so I started very early in my, my interest in, in personality. I think that personality helps explain individuals and how they, they see themselves, see their world, and how they, they interact with it. So I think from that initial sort of fascination and interest that it grew into, you, you see people that, that engage in, in what, what I call maladaptive patterns, and it's these patterns that they engage that are so you know, self-defeating, uh, self-destructive, uh, interpersonally destructive, intrapersonally destructive as well. And so I wanted to learn more about it. I wanted to try to get an understanding of what would drive someone to do that, even knowing, even though they know that on some level, that engaging in this behavior will ultimately lead to severe negative consequences. They continue to, to still engage in that. And I think that initially it, it was hard to get an answer. So what I did is I, I dug deep in, into the topic and I wanted to find people that were, that were looking at it, that were, had been looking at it for a very, very long time. Um, and I was very fortunate that, that I, I worked with uh, some individuals that had really uh, studied a lot about personality, the conceptualization of personality, but not only the pathology of it, but also the healthy aspect of it as well. And so my, my research actually spans both. It's um, 
as of late, I've been focusing more on personality disorders, but um, also healthy personality. What are healthy components? Hmm. And that drove me to attachment. So when we talk about, um, you know, parental alienation and certainly, you know, where, where, where you guys are very passionate, you talk about attachment. Attachment is so critical when we talk about those connections and how that relates to personality. So um, personality, personality pathology, and then uh, I just continue to, to study and, and learn more. And I, I've really been challenged by, by my clients. I, I think that um, in a lot of ways, I think mental health practitioners are adverse to working with personality disorder clients. They usually don't know that they're with the personality disorder client until they're at least, I would say, six, nine, 12 sessions in. And by then, they're a little shocked and surprised and dismayed. But what's interesting about that is even you know mental health practitioners fall into that. But um, so do people that are in relationships with these mm -hmm. folks or people that employ these folks or people that are working with or living with or you know, whatever it is, going to school with with these individuals. So it's such a uh, fascinating and, and I believe central component to how people act, how they behave and, and how they interact with the world. So um, that's, that, that's how I've always been interested in it. I'm very passionate about it. I love it. I think it's very fascinating. You know, this is the thing in, in the court hearings, a lot of times in a high conflict custody situation, they bring in people's mental disorders and, and so forth as, as a detriment, some, some reason to, to cut the, the parent out of their lives. So um, how do you speak to that in regards to like custody battles and, and, the, and the personality disorders? So now, are you, are you talking in regard to the attachment to the child, or are you talking in regards about how I would feel and sort of blaming someone for their personality structure to say that you can no longer have contact with this child? Yeah, yeah. A lot of times they they, they will use that. The, the attorneys and and will use um, the the different disorders or conjure up a particular behavior and label that parent uh, with a, a specific disorder in order to actually cut, you know, sever the relationship with the parent and the child. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're dealing with, you, you specialize in these different personality disorders. Um, how is it, are, how are you able to benefit, you know, or I guess help the family in keeping the relationship intact, even though there might be a personality disorder involved. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I think what, in, in those regards, in, in that treatment aspect, I think what you need to do is, I think that it's, it's very difficult to work with a personality disorder. That, now, we're talking about the adult. So we'll, we'll say that, that this individual is an adult, that, you know, that they, they, they have a child and so on and so forth, that the adult, is the one that, that, that has to engage in treatment, that has to be willing to engage in treatment. And one of the things that, that, that I do with all my clients, we do an initial consultation session. And that's because I think a lot of folks with personality disorders are very trepidatious about getting into treatment, about engaging in it. And that in large part is because of the stigma, is because they, they could be, you know, they, they never tell their mental health provider the first session, fifth session, whatever, that they're going through a legal case and, and, until they're a little, farther down the road. And that's just not personality disorder, folks. I, I think that that's a lot of folks. Um, and I think that what, what happens is, is that um, that individual has to be willing to participate. They have to be motivated to participate. And a lot of times you get folks that are sort of exploring, is this really something to go forward? Is this something really that I need to examine? Or is it something that I want validation for my maladaptive pattern? And if we put that in, into the legal context, I think that attorneys typically grab onto the stigma. They're going to grab onto the, the words of borderline personality disorder. They're going to grab onto narcissistic personality disorder. They're going to grab onto antisocial personality disorder. And, but what's scary about that is that there are a lot of criteria that is required to actually meet those diagnoses. It's not just one component. And typically what you find, if, if we use narcissistic personality disorder as an example, to say, well, this parent is narcissistic personality disorder, and he or she is a horrible parent, and they need to be discarded, and, you know, and shouldn't be involved in, in, this, in this child life. So, but what happens is, is, very rarely is that individual actually going to meet criteria for narcissistic personality disorder. 
And I think in, in those cases, what happens is you build on the stigma. The attorneys build on the stigma. And they say, well, this is this personality disorder. How could someone grow up with a narcissistic personality disorder parent? They're going to be abused. They're going to be neglected. They're going to, and the, the trajectory isn't that clear. And so, you know, there's, there's so much variation and dimensional components associated with narcissistic personality disorder or any of the others that we, we used to categoricalize them or ca categorize them, excuse me. I don't want to make up my own word. But, uh, so, you know, we, we used to say, okay, well, narcissist is a narcissist is a narcissist, right? But that isn't true because of that variation. And now, you know, since 2013, the, the DSM-5 has come out and we're trying to move the field to understand about the dimensional, the spectrum component. And, you know, on, on, on my YouTube channel, I often talk about, you know, uh, those with borderline personality disorder traits as well as those with borderline personality disorder. And I mm -hmm. think that the court particularly tends to be very provincial in that they tend to see narcissism, narcissism, is a narcissist. That is absolutely hundred percent not true. Mm -hmm. I'm, so, I'm so glad you said that because I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I, I think what you're saying is really important for people to hear is that, um, many of us, maybe most or all of us, we might have some personality traits that are narcissistic or, um, you know, some personality traits associated with a disorder, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we have that disorder. Right. And so one question that this makes me think to ask you is, if someone is in a high conflict custody case and they need the help of a mental health professional to help them in this process, is it important that they get someone who specializes in personality disorders like you do? I think what would be critical is if they're going to bring a mental health component into play is that you have a qualified psychologist do the evaluation. And that is someone who specializes in assessment. You can't just call up a, a, a psychologist and say, okay, hey, can, can you test for this? I mean, if, if you have the degree, you can get the tests. And, you know, people people do a lot of different things for a lot of different reasons. Um, but I think that um, for a court case to be able to say that, okay, you know, there are narcissists, narcissist personality disorder, these different personality disorders, um, these components, I think the first thing you need to do is have a qualified professional with experience and competence in that area to do the assessment. Once that's in place, I think that changes the scope because um, what you find is, so for, when, when I talk about personality disorders, um, I always talk about them not as a singular entity, but as a dual, as, as a dual entity, which is that it has a core structure and a surface structure. So there are our behaviors, which are called surface structure behaviors, right? And there are things that, that you do and there are things that I do. And we all have something inside of us that drives us to do that. Presumably, if we don't have a personality disorder or we don't have a high preponderance of maladaptive traits, then we engage in what are called adaptive strategies, right? So you know, perhaps you've had a bad day, or you've had a long day, you've had a stressful day. And, but, so what do you do to manage that? Presumably, you know, you don't, you don't hit your dog. Presumably, you know, you don't drink, you know, two bits of whiskey, or, you know, you don't get, you don't get drunk and then drive your car or anything like that. Presumably, maybe you, you engage in relaxation. You take a few minutes, you take a hot shower, you do things to relax. Those are adaptive strategies. So what happens is, is that, I think if you can't understand that and you're going to add the component of parental alienation, you're going to add the component of the legal process, you end up with a very skewed understanding of, of the individual and what they're doing, how they see, certainly their family dynamic. Um, each personality tends to see family very differently. Each individual does as well. But we can generalize to different personality disorders and they see their families quite differently. Um, but I, I think that understanding what that personality is, what that core content is, what that surface structure behavior is, which is all the court's really interested in, but what's driving it? Because that can help you increase the probability of prediction of learning adaptive traits, of learning po positive interaction um, with, with that child, with that court. Are, are you at a high likelihood to work with the court to restore parental rights? Or are you at a higher likelihood to to disregard the court, to, to disregard their, you know, their, their, their requests and their demands and participate in that process.
I, I heard you say that it's important uh, that that parents find someone who is especially trained in assessing these personality disorders or traits. And so how, how do you know if someone is trained and, and qualified in that area? Are, are there certain like, are there certain certifications or accreditation? Is there something that sets them apart from other psychologists? That's my mm -hmm. question. I think that if, if you're going through a legal process, I think that you should find, you, you can find a forensic psychologist. You can find a psychologist that has testified before. Um, what, what, what I would do, what, what I recommend, I actually did, did a video. I, I get a lot of requests about how can I find a therapist where I live? How can I you know, find somebody who's qualified? How do I know somebody knows what they're doing? So I, I actually made a video on how to find a therapist because so many people were contacting me and I kept telling people the same thing over and over. I said, we'll make a video and maybe that'll help. But a lot of people don't consider, um, you know, you can get online and you can find psychologists that, that are doing these things. You can also look up who's doing research and what universities they're at. Um, you can call those universities, those psychology departments, and you can say, you know, well, you know, I read, you know, uh, I'm not currently uh, working at a, a faculty right now, but um, you, you could call University of Houston, let's say as an example, and say, you know, well, you know, Dr. Fox studies personality. Um, you know, is he available or, or do you guys know somebody that you could refer, you know, who, who could do this forensic evaluation, who could do this custody evaluation for me? Um, you know, there, there is somebody at the University of Houston that I refer to for custody and family matters. Well, I used to, he, he, he's since retired, but, um, and he is amazing. He's testified hundreds of times and he is objective, impartial, and exceptionally qualified. And, but he may know somebody that you can refer to. So it's, you know, just, just calling up Blue Cross Blue Shield or, or just finding someone who is uh, a psychologist, you, you need a little more. If you're going to talk about personality disorders and certainly assessment of personality disorders, you, you really need to find somebody who understands that process, who's done some of the research, who maybe has published a little bit on it. Um, and you can go to them or where they study and kind of work, work from there. And you'll, you'll be surprised that there's a number of people um, who understand personality disorders, who study it, who treat it, and who, who manage it. But the traditional way of just calling insurance companies or just saying, well, this is a psychologist, he's a life psychologist, he knows how to do that. I mean, that's, that is not always true. Yeah, you know, that's, that's a big thing. I mean, it's really kind of a crapshoot sometimes when, when, you know, your case is a high conflict situation, you, there's, psychological evaluations that have been ordered and there is a broad spectrum of psychologists that are in their in the business and you know you might have one that will meet you for 15 20 minutes and generate a psychological evaluation and then there might be one that will spend a whole week with each participant in the family uh, to do a thorough one and it you know the families. Uh, the future of the family is in the balance of the quality of the, uh, of the psychologist doing the evaluation. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and uh, some, you know, uh, evaluations pay a lot, you know, to, to be honest, you know, some of them pay very much. And I think that that certainly it's, uh, you know, you, you should be paid based upon your skill level and all that. I'm not, not saying it should pay less, but I'm saying that I think that that can entice people to say, well, I mean, I know what, what this measure is, or this measure is, or this measure is. So I, I, I can do it. Sure, 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 I can do it. And then they end up with, instead of doing an individualized interpretation, you, do a, you just pull together the computerized interpretation, and you're like, oh, well, see, I did it. That is, mm -hmm. that is absolutely not true, I, which is part of why the, my mentor, who I worked with, um, he was dead set against computer interpretation. I, I've... I can't use it. It makes me very uncomfortable. Well, so he's indoctrinated me to, to so I, I always look at all the values and I look at the statistics and we look at the weights and you look at, you know, all, all of these factors to make sure that we're pulling this relevant data to that particular individual we're studying. Not everybody does that. So I think you just have to find somebody who's qualified. And I think universities are an undertapped resource to find really qualified mental health. And um, a lot of, psychology departments have clinics that have sliding scales um, at University of Houston I know they've gone as low as ten dollars for some folks that I have referred there 
I just referred someone there for an evaluation yesterday. It wasn't custody, but it was mental health. Um, and I, so it's, it's an untapped resource. And I, I wish that more people do it because you're getting excellent services. You're getting just experts in the field. And it, it can be really, really affordable for folks who, who can't afford it. So it's, it's another option, an untapped resource. You know, this is, this is really important information because, I mean, this is not something that you want to play with, you know, you want to, it's super important to have someone who has all of those skills like you're talking about. And it really jumped out at me earlier when you said that it can even take a mental health professional six, nine or 12 visits with someone before they even realize that someone has a personality disorder. That's really startling and kind of scary but I think that that's a really good example of of how hidden it can be and um, it, I, I just want to ask you a question I don't know if you can answer it but <laughs> if you are trying to co-parent with someone who has been actually diagnosed with a personality disorder um, is there is your life doomed is there any hope of co-parenting with this person <laughs> because, yeah. Because, you know, again, in our world and a lot of our online discussion groups, you know, people just feel like, you know, they're doomed. You know, they, they will never be able to co-parent with this person. So, so is it possible to do that? Mm -hmm. and, and I think what's, what's critical in that is that a lot of people, um, particularly in the area of, of narcissists, a lot of folks will write me and they'll say, oh, you know, my ex was a narcissist and, you know, and all this stuff. And then, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll give a lot of, a lot of detail. But I don't think just because you identify personality traits or even the disorder means that you're doomed. And that goes back to that categorical saying that, you know, an apple is an apple is an apple. That's not true. How many, I can't, I don't even know how many different kinds of apples there are, but there's a lot. But, but, but it's the same for, 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 the, for the dimension of personality as well. So if, if you're in a relationship with someone who is entitled, that doesn't mean you're narcissistic. That means that these are people who feel like they don't have to work a lot and they deserve something really great for doing very little. But, and, but then there are people that lack empathy and there are people who, um, you know, lack recognition beyond themselves. There are, there are those who are completely self-focused. I mean, there's so many other components. And when we talk about, so, you know, how can you, and, and I, li I like how you prefaced it because you said, I don't know if you can answer this or not because it's so individualized. But I think just because there are personality traits doesn't mean that that person, or even the disorder, means that person cannot co-parent. It doesn't mean that they're a terrible parent. Um, I, I have actually had clients that were on the extreme end of borderline personality disorder. They met criteria for all nine of, of, of those criteria. We won't go through those now but all nine of those, and there are only nine criteria. So they went through all of them. They were florid, which is to the high, to the extreme of all, of all of those. And when we talk about parenting, so the question is, what kind of parent was she? There was nothing to indicate that this child suffered in any way. This, this, this woman, this client of mine, she had a lot, a lot that she was managing and dealing with and struggling with. Um, and, and I think that people watch this, they're, they're going to be like, there's no way that an extreme borderline is not hurting their, their child. It, it is possible. And I think that, that the way that, that she structured her life and the way that she managed her core content, surface content, trying to get help, managing you know, her issues, th this person was intensely driven to identify and manage her mm -hmm. issues. And she did. Now it was four and a half years of intense therapy, myself and other psychologists and groups and I mean, it was pretty intensive and she did have the financial means in order to do it, but she was able to do that. But you could write her off just by her diagnosis and you would be doing her and her child a disservice. So I, I think that we do have to look at it dimensionally. How bad or severe are these traits? You know, uh, what is the experience certainly of, of the child? What is, are, what are the ramifications of the child? Where are they? And when we talk about that co-parenting, are you doomed, right? If you find out that you're in a relationship with somebody, are you doomed? When I work with partners of narcissists, um, and you know they come in and they say, "Oh, you know my sniffing brother's narcissist and he's a jerk." Okay, so and then we're like, "All right, well let's let's kind of talk about it." But what's going to happen is is I will tell them in the consultation session. This is the first session, and I'll say, "Well, we're not going to work with an invisible client. I can only work with who's in the room." 
And what happens usually after that is that they say, well, I'm only here to get strategies for him. I don't, I don't want to work on me. Well, I, I, I can't do that. I can't work on the invisible client. I can only work with the person in the room. And sometimes people elect to say, well, I don't want to do that. I said, okay. But, but then what happens is if you continue to participate in treatment, we're going to explore what keeps you in that relationship, what's driving you in that relationship, that co-parenting aspect. What, what, are, what are your behaviors? What are his or her behaviors? And then so we, we explore it and going forward. And ultimately, you want to build this sense of self in that partner, the partner of the narcissist, so that they can make a conscious choice to say enough is enough, or we're going to do this together and we're going to parent in a way that is successful for the child, that we can move this child forward. Wow. I, I think what you're saying is so incredibly important for our viewers to hear because again, in a lot of our online discussion groups, the word narcissist gets tossed around a lot yes. and a lot of alienated or targeted parents are focused on how much they dislike their ex or how unhappy they are about the way their ex behaves. Um, and I try to encourage people to focus more on themselves. You know, how can you respond differently or how can you manage this relationship better? Um, because like it or not, I mean, once you're, a, you know, a, a parent with them, that's forever, probably. So um, I'm really glad that you said that. And I have to ask you this question because I, I hear this quite a bit too. Um, if your child is living most of the time with a parent who is a narcissist, let's say they have been diagnosed, mm -hmm. uh, will that turn your child into a narcissist? No. Okay. No. no. What happens is, is that typically you, the, the child doesn't become a narcissist. The child, a lot of times, um, has a lot of internalized wounds. And typically what happens is that you see that they grow up with a lot of insecurities, a lot of uncertainty, because the narcissist, the narcissism, and if we're talking about somebody, we'll, we'll say that this person meets the full criteria for narcissistic personality. So they have enough of the criteria. The severity is enough that it warrants, there's enough, um, enough maladaptive patterns, so on and so forth. So what happens is, is that the child ends up growing up feeling very inadequate, very unsure of themselves. And what I find, it doesn't put them on a narcissistic trajectory. A lot of times, well, maybe not a lot of times, but it puts them on a trajectory more for borderline personality disorder, histrionic personality disorder, but on the trajectory does not mean they're going to end up with that disorder. It means that they can develop those traits. So they end up with a very low self-worth, a lot of uncertainty about themselves, and all of us recapitulate our, our early development. We, we don't want to believe that, right? Um, and when, when I do my seminars and I'm teaching other mental health providers and we talk about um, sort of, you know, the developmental process of personality disorders and things like that. And then I'll usually say, okay, so let's think back to when we were 16, right? And you said, I'll never be like them. How'd that work out? Not too good, right? I mean, we, we all have components of, of our parents, right? My dad has a very sarcastic, dry sense of humor that my wife finds questionable. <laughs> but she knew that I had that coming into it. We've been together almost 20 years. She, she knows. And, um, you know, so, uh, you know, there, there, are, there are components. Just because the parent is narcissistic to, does not mean that the child will be. But there will be, there typically is, I don't want to say it's so matter of fact, but there, there is typically some type of markers or identifiers or um, in, internal core structure issues that are, that are present with, with that child. So, um, so I'm, what I'm getting... And we're just about run out of time. But so, so what my takeaway is, is first that there's an amazing resources of professionals through the universities and the college system uh, that, that are untapped um, and are affordable to parents. And the other part that I'm getting is that just taking, extracting the child from a a parent who has a, a personality disorder that's diagnosed is not necessarily the answer because the child may in fact um, 
have it within their DNA and um, taking them out of that, uh, taking the parent away is not necessarily the answer to changing the direction of the child's future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th that they might have some of those components. I didn't want to make it sound like that there's a high genetic component of, of narcissism or, or borderline. The, the genetic studies vary, and, um, and I know we're out of time, so we won't go into that because I, I could go all day with that. But, um, but and what, one of the things that I'm, I'm going to discuss uh, during, during the, the, the seminar in October is to talk about these components, about what the different... Um, you know, that 90% 90, 90 of individuals, and perhaps your, your, your data matches as well, that 90% of individuals uh, that engage in, in behaviors of parental uh, alienation are mothers. But, and, and that comes from the, from the 2006 Baker study that, that was done, and, and the different components and presentation of different types of, of mothers who engage in this, so on and so forth. Uh, but that number is so high that, I mean, we, we have to take, take that with a little bit of grain of salt. And I think that you know we we do have to consider the the different aspects and different ramifications that are are associated with with identifying a, a disorder that can be as destructive as some of the ones we've been talking about tonight, um, and just so easily or, or quickly identifying that you know well it's genetic and you're going to see in the child and one narcissist makes another makes another uh, it it doesn't necessarily work work that that smoothly. Got it. Wow. It's a lot. It's a lot of great information, yeah. and it's a lot of really important information. I think that it's uh, a lot of things that, for those of us who are in the parental alienation education and support world, we need to know about these things, uh, and be more mindful of the, of the of the very. I guess I would say, you know, there can be different factors, and and just because someone has some. Um, personality traits does not necessarily mean that they've got the full-blown personality disorder and uh, and I think you also stress the importance of of children needing to have a relationship with both parents whenever that's at all possible, so possible. I, I'm so I'm so excited about you speaking at the conference in Houston in October and I, I hope a lot of people um, we'll come to meet you and hear what you have to say. It's really, really important information for, for everyone that is interested in parental alienation, co-parenting, and also uh, personality disorders. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fox, for being on our show today. Uh, we do have to come to an end, unfortunately. There are so many things to talk about. So I'm going to end it with a quote from our co-host, Wendy Perry. Parental alienation can happen to anyone, so it should matter to everyone. Have a great evening, everyone, and thank you for joining Custody Matters Live.